share with you a couple issues. One of them is, I think you're aware that uh, Mark Bell passed away and uh, the funeral was yesterday. And I just want to make a, a note uh, from a personal standpoint. And, uh, Maud is one of those gals, as I said at the funeral, that you never want to give up on. And uh, she is going to be greatly missed. And uh, I thought about it afterwards. You know, Maud always liked to walk. And she would walk after everybody in Finland. She said she was walking because she didn't want to get old. <laughs> and uh, I, I will tell you that probably, not probably, but today, according to scripture, she's walking on the streets of gold. And I'm, I'm pretty confident she has explored every brick in that street of gold right now. So, uh, our condolences to the family and all the gold. In the back of the church are a couple other issues, uh, a couple of things. Uh, on the communication table are sign-up sheets for the Sweetheart Serenade. That's going to be at Pastor Chet's on the 16th of February. <coughs> If you and the suite would like to be involved with that, please uh, feel free to come to, to, to sign up for that. Also, um, uh, we are we need uh, just a few other people to sign up for the children's feed on Wednesday night. If you'd like to uh, participate in that, please sign up. Uh, we've got a couple spots open, and that sign-up sheet's on the refrigerator in the kitchen. Okay? There was one other thing, and I forgot what it was, but I think you know, Pam has something very important to say. Yeah. Um, on behalf of Dave and I, we would just like to thank the church for the flowers, the cards, the concerns, the prayers. Um, Dick is doing as well as can be expected. He's getting, you know, a little bit stronger. And uh, hopefully one of these days he'll be back. He's just scared about being around too many people because, like I say, with the flu and all this and that. But uh, he just want to. Again, thanks for Brandy, stand up. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Brandy will be moving to Florida to be with her husband. And you're going to Fort Walton Beach? Oh, so she's going to be with her husband. Brandy, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, came to, to know the Lord. Uh, through the ministry of uh, Elaine Sweet. And we have watched her grow spiritually. You know, and uh, I do not look forward to these days when we say goodbye to those that we care about. But we also know that you're going to be going somewhere else, and I'm going to tell you to get involved in the church and minister to those around there. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good morning. I want Brandy to come up here and stand with me. Is Elaine here? Elaine, you come here too. I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but you know what? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a rare occasion when somebody leaves the church for the right reasons. It's sad to say that. But you know, I know the impact this young lady has had on our little ones on Wednesday night. As Pastor said, you know, we watched her, we watched her grow, and uh, thanks to Elaine's influence, and uh, you know that influence permeates because uh, I had the privilege of marrying Brandy and Daniel, and uh, Daniel came to the Lord. And that was no clue. And I truly believe in my heart that God has a mission and a calling for this young couple. And, it, you know, I told her, I said, I'm probably going to cry when you leave. And that's no lie. But uh, I, I would like the elders that are here to come up because we want to pray that God would send this young lady off and that wherever the Holy Spirit leads her and her husband, that they will make a difference in other people's lives. And I'm going to, and Pastor, I'm going to ask you to pray, if that's okay. And, uh, and I want you folks to join your faith with ours up here as we uh, lay hands on Brandy, okay? Father, we give you thanks for Brandy. And the uh, Lord has been just an exciting adventure. Exciting to see her grow in you. And Lord, I still remember the first day in which Elaine called and uh, gave the testimony. So Lord, I, I, I pray for her. I pray for her and Daniel. And I pray that as they go south, that uh, Lord, you will touch them and you will bring, uh, bring her to a church in which she can uh, really grow in you. I pray for them, I lift them up, and I just pray that as we send her off, that the gospel of Jesus Christ will go forward and through them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and Booth. 
Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Let us pray. O oh, most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your call, for we were once those sinners. <coughs> but you called to us, Lord. You called us by name, and you touched our hearts, and we accepted. And Lord, because of that, we have great strength, great confidence in everything you're going to do. We have confidence in the days to come, for you're with us. We have confidence in where we're heading because you have prepared a place for us in paradise. And nothing formed against us can stand because you are with us. You are our strength and our guide. Lord, anoint the pastors who brings forth your message. Open our hearts to receive. Let it go deep inside that we can serve you better. That we can submit to you and be the instrument you desire. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yours. We are celebrating two successes today. We are celebrating the success of Maud entering into the kingdom of God. And we are also celebrating the success of Brandy as well, going to the kingdom of the mouse and Florida. <laughs> Where is Fort Walton anyway? Uh, it is in the extreme northwest of Florida. Like in that That's all over. Yeah. Okay. Forget about the mouse. <laughs> We're changing country. So, I want to share with you today. Uh, there we go. Conspiracy of lovers. Come on, as, as Ted read. Uh, the story of Jesus when he called Levi. Now, Levi was actually Matthew. So if you get into the Bible and you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, here's Matthew. And uh, Matthew is, is uh, of course, one of the, as I said last week, not the actual first gospel, because they're not in chronological order, but the one that we can notice as being first. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about three characters that are found in this. Now, we're, we're going to go a little fast now, because... The first service, I spent too much time on this, and I didn't get to what I want to do. So, uh, so we're going to go a little fast. In this. So basically, three characters that are found in this particular scripture passage. The Pharisee, Levi, and Jesus. Now, let's talk about who a Pharisee is. Pharisee is a religious leader who is self-righteous. He bases his righteousness based upon his works, what I do. I am holy because I do these great things. The problem with somebody who has that type of mentality is, is that when you develop a mentality of, of works centered, it is not God glorifying centered. It becomes me. I am good because of what I do. Now we all know that we are all sinners, and because of that we cannot achieve God's glory or, or be where God wants us to be, but the, but, so we have to depend upon Jesus Christ. The Pharisee, as I said, is one who... Uh, because of his righteousness, became very judgmental. You've been around people that way, haven't you? They're just extremely judgmental. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do, it's wrong. I mean, you could, you could go out there and you could go up and clean their backyard for them just because you want to be nice, and they'll complain about how you do it. The Pharisee is that type of a person. He's a person that uh, would look at the law, the written law, and then he would say, okay, there are 613 laws that are found in the Old Testament. I'm going to fulfill them all. Now, in case you're wondering what I mean by 613, the Pharisees at one time, not one time, but they went through the Old Testament, and they got all of the rules that are found in the Old Testament, and they put them down, and that's called the written law. And there are 613 of them. For example, not to break an oath or a vow, or... 
He must not cut his hair, referring to a Nazarite. He must not eat grapes, uh, referring to a Nazarite. Uh, we are to enjoy the three festivals that are found in scriptures. Uh, an uncircumcised male must not eat of it. Uh, let's see, what are some other ones here? Observe the laws of impurity concerning liquid and solid foods. Uh, appointment of judges. Carrying out the laws in order of inheritance. Uh, a witness must not serve as a judge in capital crimes. Um, trans transgressors must not testify. Mourn for their relatives. Fear your father and your mother. Respect your father and mother. Do not strike your father and mother. Do not curse your father and mother. Got that, David? Okay. <laughs> You're my only kid left here. I don't want to pick them up. But, you know, here's, here's the laws that are found here. And they, they wrote them down, and it's called the written law. And a Pharisee would adhere to them. Now, here's the problem, Okay. Not only was there a, was a written law, there was an oral law. You say, what's the oral law? <laughs> the Pharisees would add to the law, basically saying, this is how we, how to better understand and better apply that to your life. So essentially they were adding to the law. Now, I spent days trying to find a list of the oral law. I couldn't find it. Maybe some of you can, but I just could not find the oral law. And because I wanted to just to share some of them with you. But it was like I say, keep the Sabbath day holy. What does that mean? That means you keep the Sabbath day holy and you don't, let's say you don't, uh, you don't cook or you don't go out to eat or you don't uh, drive your car or you don't make somebody pump gas. Or, or, and if we take it to an extreme that we could, the oral law says basically you shouldn't even turn on your lights because if you do, somebody has to work in order for those that electricity to come to your house. <coughs> and so here we have this oral law that's out there. And the Pharisees had applied that so much to them that uh, they had basically set themselves apart from the rest of the world and the rest of society. Okay, and that's number one, the Pharisees. The second one is enter Levi, the tax collector. So you have a Pharisee, and now you have Levi the tax collector. There are two types of tax collectors that were back then. One is called a Gabai, and the other one is called a Mokas. A Gabai tax collector is the general taxes. This is the person that would come to your house, and, like an auditor, would come to your house and say, okay, your house is worth... Uh, $175,000, therefore your tax is going to be however much it's going to be for the year, and I expect you to pay it. The other tax collector, collector was the mocus. Probably the best way that I could figure to describe a mocus is, is you get on the toll road and there's a toll booth. That's a mocus. Okay. Now, I don't want any of you to go to the toll booth on I-90 and I-80 and say, call them a mogus. They wouldn't even know what that's referring to. But here's the issue. Rome had infiltrated and had occupied Palestine, or Israel. They had an army there. They had to pay for that army. They could not take loans out like we do today. They had to pay that army. How are you going to pay the army? Through taxes. So Rome expected so much money to come from Palestine or Israel at that time. So Rome would send this message to all the Gabais and all the Moguses and say, I expect so much money from Israel. And so then they would go out and they would start collecting the taxes thereof. Well, how do the Moguses and the Gabais survive? Well, Rome didn't care how you got the money. They just wanted the money. So let's say that I, I went here, I went to Chet, and I said, I'm going to charge you $100 for the fact that you're married to your wife. Trust me, the Mocuses would do that kind of stuff. And so he would say, okay, I'm going to give $50 to Rome, I'm going to give $25 to myself, and I'm going to give $25 to someone else. <clears throat> Who's that? The thugs. You see, the best, a Mocus would be considered the, and I just lost what I was going to say, the gangs, the crime, the mafia, that's where I wanted, 
the mafia of the time. The mafia would come in and they would say, there's money, so therefore I'm going to go in and I'm going to get in charge of this. And so he had a major mocus, and then he had little mocuses that were under them. The major mocus would, would give the, oh, kind of weird, isn't it? Would give you can you could be at this bridge on Trent Avenue, you could be at this bridge on on uh, Main Street, you could be over here, and at those booths is where you collect your taxes. If you went up there and the mocus would look at you and say, "Okay, now David is driving a Ferrari, therefore I'm going to charge him a thousand dollars to go across this bridge," or "I'm driving a 1979 Pinto, I realize you can only spend a dollar, therefore I'm going to charge." He could charge it based on what he wanted to do. There was real taxes. There was you name it, all those taxes. And that's why I say a good way to describe it is like on the turnpike. Hey, truck drivers, how do they charge you on the turnpike per axle? And so here I would come up and I would I would come to this bridge. I have to get across it, and I have to pay this mocus in order to get across. He charges me based on what he wants to charge. And of course, you're angry every time you come up to it because you know you got to deal with this guy. If you don't pay him, here's your here's your thugs that are going to beat beat you up in order to get the money. Intimidation. All this was going on. So that's the mogus. Levi. Which one was he? Was he a goodbye or was he a mogus? I'm spending a lot of time on mogus. So what do you think? Mogus. Why? Because the Bible says in Matthew, in Mark chapter two, Levi was at a booth. That's a mocus. Of the two tax collectors, the ones that was hated the most were the mocuses. The Bible says that they, or not, the Torah says, not the Torah, uh, I just lost the name of it. But anyway, they considered the mocuses to be the sinners among the sinners. They were barred from the synagogue. They could not go into the synagogue. They could not enter the temple. They couldn't even testify in court. Because not only were they taking money from other individuals, they were also, what were they doing? They were siding with Rome. How dare you side with them? Now, so now you have the Pharisees, the religious leaders, who were self-righteous, very judgmental, uh, based upon my works. You had the Mocuses, or Levites, who were rejected by the society and the religious elite, were considered the lowest of the low. And then all, along some, all of a sudden, you have this guy named Jesus that shows up. And Jesus is walking along one day, and he sees Levi, and he has a very simple message to Levi. What was it? Follow me. Follow me. And so Jesus came, and he says, I came to be a physician to the sinners. I came to change the religious status quo. And then because of that, he was hated by the religious elite. Because Jesus was what? He was going after the uh, power of the religious people. And there's another one that we don't talk about very much. He had gone against their traditions. Tradition is something that we have grown up with and has become so ingrained in our lives that it's hard for us to change, especially as we get older. <laughs> If there's one thing that I've learned as I'm getting older, older is how much I don't know. Is how much I really don't know. And how, my, how many times some of my pharisaical attitudes have pushed me away from people that needed to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Son of God, God incarnate, came and he became the, came to be a physician to the sinners. See, Jesus went up to the Mocus, went up to Levi, and the message was very simple. Follow me. It wasn't a big one. It wasn't, a, you know, you have to do ten steps right, three steps left, but it was a very simple message. Follow me. What does that mean? Come on, let's go. Let's go on the journey of life together. What was Levi's response? Verse 14. He immediately left. Now there are consequences of that. In the area of syndicated crime, if you leave, you aren't coming back. 
And so here's Levi. He's leaving, and guess what's going to happen? He's going to lose his booth. Someone is there who's greedy, who wants the money, and he's going to take it over. And there's absolutely no way that he can go back and he can take it over all over again. <clears throat> Levi lost everything when he followed Jesus. And instead of the Pharisees, the religious people, being excited that they got rid of one more locust in the world, they were upset that Jesus was staying, spending time with the locust. In fact, Jesus went to Levi's house, and he ate with Levi. And what did they do? How dare he eat with sinners? <clears throat> something very something interesting there. Get in your Bible. Who was at Levi's house? Very, very important thing we don't see too much. Who's there? Other tax collectors and other sinners. You see what's happening? The Pharisees had so pushed everyone else away that these people who were sick, spiritually sick, needed, they're going to flock together. And when we push people away, when we push people out, when we say, you know what, in order to be part of us, you have to, they're going to go somewhere. Why do you think if, when, you, when you drive downtown Finley or, or go down Broad Street in Finley, you see people constantly going into the bar? Because they can relate to each other. <coughs> And so, what was the Pharisee's response? How dare you eat with sinners? How dare you spend time with them? And Jesus turns around, and what does he say? <coughs> he says, wait a minute. If you're sick, you go to a physician. I have come to be the physician to the sick. <coughs> now, with that in mind, what lessons do we learn? Or why am I bringing this up? If we are to follow the example of Jesus in our lives and in this church, we need to be open to the mocuses. And we need to allow the mocuses in our church. The Bible, or there are some statistics that are going out there, and I, I, I don't quite know how to read them. Because, you know, you've heard it said that there's no difference between the world and the church. You know, you've heard that many times. There's no difference between the world and the church or exactly the same and everything else. In fact, if you look at the, at the statistics, there's actually more in the church than in the world. And you know what? Part of me says good. Do you know why? Because we're a hospital. Am I right? How many well people are at a hospital? You're usually sick. You go into the hospital and you're, there's usually something wrong, right? And a lot of times you don't go into the hospital unless there's something wrong and some little red flag goes, woohoo, there's a problem, you need to take care of this. Many times in our society it's the same thing. We don't wake up to the fact that there is a God that loves and cares about us until we fall flat on our faces. And when somebody falls flat on their faces, the church needs to be here and be the physician and just you know, go around them, bring them up, share them the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm going to use Brandy as an example. She's leaving, so, you know, I don't have to worry about her leaving the church. <laughs> I remember when Elaine emailed me about Brandy. And this is what she said. I have this friend who said, I used to not believe in God. Now I do believe in God. Tell me more about it. Had we been pharmaceutical, we would have said she deserves everything she's getting. Had we been a Pharisee church, we would have said she deserves absolutely everything she's getting. But she broke the law. Here's the problem, Brandy. How do you know the law if no one tells you? Right? 
So we have the locusts. They're not allowed to be in the temple. They're not allowed to do anything. In, in fact, the Pharisees weren't even allowed to share to, with a sinner what the law said. Right? It's crazy. How can anyone come to know the law if they're not taught the law? How can anyone know about Jesus Christ if we don't share about the good news of Jesus Christ with them? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is this passage that really changed my life when I read it one time. And it was talking about sin in the church. And, and, and Paul made this comment. He says, what right it is of ours to judge those outside the church? We should be judging those inside the church because God's going to take care of those outside the church. That was it. See, many times we sit up here at the church and we point and we go, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And those I'm pointing outside the church and, and, and Paul's saying, clean up our act. Become that hospital. Allow people to come in. Allow them to, to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. But they're not going to follow Jesus if we don't tell them about him. And the Pharisees wouldn't even tell the Mogus about them. We have successfully raised, and I've said this many times, the first generation of told human kids. I cannot say told. But we have successfully raised the first generation of mainly heathen kids in our society. I know that because when I go into the jail and I talk to those prisoners, they, some of them even come up and say, tell me about this Jesus. What are you talking about? With all the Billy Grahams, with all of the, uh, uh, all the televangelists and everything else that's on TV, their view of the church comes from Hollywood. And Hollywood does not have a good view of the church. I am convinced 100% that Washington, D.C. Is, is not in charge of our country. I am convinced Los Angeles is. Because all you have to do is listen to Los Angeles, and eventually Washington, D.C. will follow. So what are our kids getting? MTV. They're getting reality shows that every other word is being bleeped out. They're getting anything. I thought about yesterday when I was watching the Cosby show. It's one of my favorite shows. It shows your age, but I was, I think, it's one of my favorite shows. And I'm sitting here look, watching the Cosby show. And I'm thinking about it. And I'm going, a family. A family. Here is a family. Husband, wife, children, family. Modern family. I don't even watch that show. But where's the families anymore? There aren't all the TVs anymore. Believe it. I don't believe it. But you know what? People will emulate what they see. And if that's all that they see, they're going to act that way. And then we cannot understand why we've got guns in the school system, where we have to have armed guards in our school system. And when I was in school, the worst thing we ever did is, you know, well, we did blow up the toilet, but that was a different story. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? We didn't need the armed guards. And now we do. 1954, 4% of the population became pregnant out of wedlock. Now it's 48% of the population. In some, some areas, it's as high as 85%. And we wonder why we're having issues? And yet, the Pharisees won't even go to them and say, you know what, I got something better for you. I got something better. His, his name is Jesus Christ. And I, all he says is follow me. And, 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 we, and, and we're going to allow you to and start the journey. Start the journey. We, the Pharisees don't even do that because they say you deserve everything that you're getting right now. And the Mocuses are saying, well, how am I supposed to live? You know. No, they don't know. We don't know. They don't know. 
Because no one has ever told them that there is a God that cares about them and that He has a wonderful plan for your life and that He can, he can change things around. Yes, you're still going to go through difficulties. I'm, I'm sure Brandy, if she would be up here, I, and she would say, yeah, I've had difficulties since I've become a Christian, but she's had a church that's been around her and she's had Jesus Christ in her life. Amen. That's the key. Amen. We start here and we start moving. But are we, going to be, are we going to be the Pharisee and we're going to say no or are we going to say yes? Yes, when they come into the church, yes, it's going to be dirty. Yes, it's going to be messy. Yes, it's going to happen. But I'm going to tell you, as I read scriptures, the ones that we should be angry at are those who call themselves Christians and aren't doing anything about it. Versus those who are not Christian or a young Christian and are learning. Here's the question. Which of the three do I resemble the most? Am I a Pharisee where I point my fingers? Yeah, you can say I'm very thin and I'm yeah. Are you a mocus? And you say, you know what? I never heard. I never knew. And I want to follow. Or do we resemble Jesus? Who went to the sinners and ate with them. He shared the good news that you can follow him. Question number two is, how do I accept the mocuses in my life? Do I accept them as Jesus did, or am I a Pharisee? And then thirdly is, which mocus has Jesus placed in my life to be the physician to? year and hopefully in the next few months I'll be able to present to you the congregation to be able to have that, those, that confidence that you need that comes from the Holy Spirit to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. It is not an issue of growing this church. It's an issue of growing the kingdom of God. And Christians, if you really believe that there is a heaven and you really believe there is a hell, and you're going to do everything in your power to get as many people out of hell as possible. Even if they are monks. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and I pray for each and every person here and help us to become obedient to you and help us to be serious in you. And I pray that, uh, Lord, you will bring focus to our minds so that we can focus on the good news of Jesus Christ and help them to say yes to you. Lord, be with us. And bless us and guide us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Guide us and may your direction be upon us. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name.